Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to inter introduce to you uh, Ila Norbash, uh, who is an associate professor of robotics and head of the robotics master's program at the Robotics Institute at Carly Carnegie uh, Mellon University. I um, just want to remind everyone that this is a, uh, uh, going to be published on Google Video, so keep your confidential questions uh, to the end uh, after we stop recording. So uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Ila. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I was here 10 months ago describing the beginnings of a program in educational robotics, and we had a certain attitude about what it means for humans and robots to work together for learning and discovery. And I'm back because the two things I announced 10 months ago are on their way and have actually uh, carried some significant mileage forward. So I think it's fun to share with you the results of those programs. I'm here to unveil some new technology that you can use. And um, there's been a significant attitude shift in my lab, which I think is interesting and educational for you to know about. So I want to tell you about the attitude shift we've had about what it means to use robots in community and uh, exploration. Now, I'm going to take you back a little ways first. I started my talk last time by talking about uh, wonder and learning and what it means to create systems in an Aristotelian sense that engage people in discovery. Um, so I want to give you an example that's really early. Uh, this is a cabinet of curiosity. For those of you who don't know, this is a Victorian era device that you might fill up with relics from myths or legends or travels that you've taken around the world with things that you find fascinating. There are things that launch for you a sense of excitement about the world. Um, some of them are real. Some of them are actual devices like the little shrunken head that you got in Tanzania. Other ones are, are links, really. They're a model of something that's far too big to put in the device. But what happens is you make this cabinet. And there's two things that are really interesting about this cabinet that I want to tell you about. One of the things that's interesting about the cabinet is it's inherently social. The reason you make a cabinet of curiosities is because you want to invite your friends over to your home to visit you and see it. And you want to share with them everything that's in there and fill them with a sense of wonder and curiosity about the places you've been. And they do the same thing to you, by the way. And you can imagine it's a bit of an arms race. Everybody has to have the coolest cabinet on the block. That's one reason you make the cabinet. And that fact that it's intentionally social, I think almost none of you are old enough to get the metaphor I'm about to provide you. But I'll try anyway. If you're old enough to remember Mosaic, what we used to do in the days of Mosaic is bookmarking. We would create a collection of bookmarks to the most interesting other places to see using Mosaic. And then we'd share them with our friends. So in a very interesting and odd way, the Victorian Cabinet of Curiosities is the predecessor to the kind of social bookmarking that took off 15 years ago and has obviously become pretty important these days. That's one reason that this is really interesting. The second reason I start with this slide is because there's something very special about the Cabinet of Curiosities. It's all tangible artifacts. It's physical, tangible things that you hold in your hand and touch and manipulate. And that idea of tangible artifact as bookmarks and as links becomes a very important aspect of the kind of learning that we've been seeing happen in middle school girls, high school boys, and 50-year-old African-American adults that have been uh, part of our program. So the idea of the tangible product has become really important to us. And to replay that for you, you know, I keep talking about wonder and delight. And those passions are, to me, very important in our work. This is an old robot. But it's, in a way, the purest form I've found that captures for people wonder and delight. It's a gyroscopically stabilized salad bowl called the Gyrover, designed by Ben Brown and others at Carnegie Mellon. And I was lucky enough to be involved in the project. But what I was lucky enough to do is observe how kids and adults interacted with it, what kind of questions it caused in their heads, how it changed their perspective on mechanism and technology and their interactions with mechanism. Kids would run around with this at full speed, as you can imagine, playing sprinting games. It was a device that, for me, captured the essence of robotics. The physical embodiment of a robot provides a platform upon which you have an incredible potential for causing delight and wonder and curiosity in a very natural way in people. And where you take that with people is a very exciting next step. Now, can we make more devices that instill wonder and delight that cause people to kind of attend to something and find it exciting? Sure. That's not hard. And we've done that. You do it by taking great designers, and you do it by taking great cognitive psychologists and great roboticists and putting them in one room and having them design an experience. So it's a professional robot, if you will, designed for wonder. And we've done that. The juxtaposition between this robot uh, being a very new device and the dinosaurs being 75 million years old is really interesting. And kids love to follow it around, and adults like to laugh at that irony. Um, this is another example of that kind of ironic juxtaposition that causes delight in people. 
insect telepresence. Let's take the smallest of creatures, a Madagascan hissing roach, and create a large trestle type robot that actually allows a tiny camera to be moved around in that uh, colony, in that terrarium. I can tell you from first hand experience that being chased around the terrarium by the Madagascan hissing roach at full speed is invigorating. It is delightful. And it's kind of like a video game, but better, because it's real. And designing an experience like that and then watching the kind of learning that goes on in the kids has been really fantastic. I'll give you one more example and move on. Um, this is a personal exploration rover, a scale model of the Mars rover that actually looks at rocks in exploratorium and looks for signs of biofluorescent life, which we've sprayed onto the rocks. So you're going out and doing discovery. And all of a sudden, the robot is making you physically feel like a scientist. You're not a roboticist, mind you. You're a scientist. You're discovering facts about the world, using the robot as a vessel for doing that discovery. Again, it's not that hard to design these professional exhibits, but there is something lacking in them that's really important. And it's the line of influence that is the problem here. As with most technology, here the problem is that we're designing a technology that influences people. And that can buy you something, right? It can buy you people that are excited by the technology. It can buy you people that change behavior to some degree because of the technology. But this is broken, in my opinion. And the shift in values that we've had in my group has to do with uh, turning this problem around on its head. What can we do so that in a much more basic and pure way, people are influencing technology? How can we allow people who are not technologists to have a role in influencing the technology of tomorrow? Maybe it's that question and that aspect of wonder and learning that could really drive an ability to shape the future, not by us technologists, but by people in general. So that's the direction that we've been going. And where, how do we do that um, is a question I want to try and answer for you today. But to do that, I have to start a little bit on a personal side. So I have to start with how I've arrived at this. And this won't take long, but it's worth doing, I think. So my personal path toward that point starts with where I began being a roboticist. I was not a roboticist. I was an artificial intelligence guy studying logic and reasoning. I made planning systems for little robots that had twin PowerBook 140s on top, running Macintosh Common Lisp, doing reasoning. That's what I did. Now, we happened to use that robot for my planning and reasoning work just because we thought it was an interesting demonstrator for the logic that we were building. That's all. It was merely a demonstration vehicle. What we discovered was that those early robots, this is serial number two from Nomadic Technologies. So I was lucky enough to use serial number one and two from that company many years past. We discovered that these early robots didn't have the perceptual richness and effectory richness that we would want from something that's instantiated in the real world. So guess what happened? We became engineers. We started trying to make the robots better. And in so doing, we added perceptual richness to the robots, like a vision system. But when we added perceptual richness, when the robots became better able to comprehend the world and behave in a rich way with the people of the world, then we stumbled into a, an unknown space. And that was a very interesting unknown space. We watched children interacting with our robot in meaningful ways for hours at a time. This was a robot in the quad at Stanford University, wandering around, just trying not to die and fall down the staircase. And kids were given candy for trying to get it to go down the staircase. <laughs> but that's not what they did. You know what they did? They played with the robot, started to build their own cognitive model of how the robot behaves, and they designed games around the robot. And they started playing games with each other, using the robot, again, as an interactive vessel for playing games with each other. It caused child-to-child -child communication and model making. And to us, this was huge. And it was a resounding failure in our ability to understand how the robot would behave with people, and more importantly, how would people behave in view of the robot. So the problem that we faced, which is a really interesting problem, is that we, it became clear to us, had completely re leapfrogged the question of robot-human ecology. What is the natural ecology between robots and humans? How should humans and robots behave with one another? And how do we design robots so that that ecology is appropriate and socially positive? We missed that boat completely. We were just engineers building engineering technology. And that was fascinating that we had missed that. Now, once we got that, what did we do? Well, the only thing we could do is become cognitive psychologists, right? So we put on cognitive science hats and got them on our team and started trying to understand what are the models that are being built in people's heads as they use these unknown technology artifacts. How are they reasoning about the world around them? And how does it change the way they re represent their relationship to other people in the world? Deep, interesting questions. And just to give you a few examples from that and why it became important to go that direction. When we did ethnographic observation, when we really studied how people behave and turned the camera away from the robot and toward the people, we start to see really interesting things. Here's a group of people at one of our exhibits of the San Francisco Exploratorium. It's an extended family, a couple of friends and grandparents and parents. They sat at this exhibit for more than half an hour, 
They let each person in the group, every one of them, young and old, take a turn using the interface and exploring with the robot. And then when they were all done observing each other do this, they all huddled, talked about the robot, and watched other people use it. So you were managing to capture on film and in our analysis a kind of family communication, a kind of uh, discourse that occurred as a result of their interactions with that robot, which if we were to really hope well, we even hoped that maybe that night at the dinner table, maybe they were actually talking about that interaction and what it means about technology. Maybe they were talking about the Mars rovers and how the Mars rovers work and what the scientists do when they collude to decide where the Mars rover should go. So we were changing conversation, and that was very deep for us. I'll give you one other example. Um, three girls in a class we taught at NASA Ames Moffett Field in uh, robotic autonomy. We had them learn to program using robots that this gentleman right here helped program. So uh, you, have, you have somebody right here who's actually built our robots. What happened in this course that was interesting is, again, we looked ethnographically at what are the models that these kids are making and how are they learning. We interviewed them, and we had them journal and blog their breakthroughs. Here's some example quotes, just to give you a sense of the depth with which we were seeing transformation in these girls. They did not know how to program. They were un from underprivileged neighborhoods in San Jose. And they say, teamwork is hard with varying levels of skill and different personalities can be rewarding only through compromise. This is high school students, 10th graders, able to grasp the most important things about teamwork that you can possibly grasp, how you deal with it, and what the problems are with it. This is another one that, again, shows a depth of understanding that we thought was kind of stunning, right? Make active decisions, have the attitude, if I don't do it, nobody will, and remember that if you choose to do something, you're choosing not to do other things. I didn't get this till I was in college, and Terry Winograd lectured me, because I went to him and said, I'm really concerned about this AI field in the Department of Defense, and he said that. I didn't get that till college, and these kids have it, and we didn't tell it to them. They figured this out. We thought that that was really exciting. So those kinds of results made us feel that we're at an interesting crossroads. The average university research project is supposed to make incremental research. So you improve next year on what you did last year, and you keep doing this, and then you get tenure, and then you keep doing this. Okay, That's, that's life. That's the university world. We were at a funny crossroads. We were thinking, well, we're getting results that are really interesting. They're not really robotics results. They're human community results. They're education results. Should we just keep making incremental progress? Should we make the curriculum a little bit better? Or should we kind of stop and scale up? So we decided to stop and scale up. We decided to take a big left turn. And as much as we can, scale our effort up. This is where the word community comes into play. We can't teach 1,000 courses around the country. What we can do is create dissemination packages and create the opportunity for people around the country to start teaching 1,000 courses or start using robots in creative ways. So I want to give you two examples of that, one of which I mentioned last time, and I can show you some results from that. I forgot my little CMU cam. Let me see if I have it here. There it is, little guy. OK, so one kind of community that we created was all about creativity with robots, but a particular kind of creativity. Now, another gentleman in this room, I think, Chuck, is actually the principal inventor of this. So you'll see that we have this weird pattern in our lab of having people do good things, and then they leave us for this big company in the Bay Area. <laughs> I don't understand it. But anyway, so the idea here was we want the hobby robotics community to be able to be creative with something that is all about wonder, vision. One of the most wondrous things you can do for children and adults alike is show them a robot that has vision. They can track a red ball and move its gaze around and go chase after it and pick it up and throw it and laugh. When you give them a robot that can do that, there's kind of magic that the vision shows, a magic sort of invisible connection between the robot and an awareness of the world that it's imbued with. And that's really powerful. So we've been working on CMU cams over the years, but in the most recent incarnation, it really has morphed into a sense of community robotics that I think has been quite powerful. I'll pass around the CMU Cam 3. This just came out a couple of months ago. What's different about this from the previous versions, if any of you are CMU Cam uh, entrepreneurs, is that it has an SD card slot on it and a FAT16 file system, so you can just save JPEGs to it right there and then go look at them. And that it's an ARM 9 core running Linux, not running Linux, it's an ARM 9 core. You just program it. You cross compile it for it in GCC. So the beauty is you can now write code for this. You don't have to use a predetermined set of semantic libraries that we give you, although we still have that set of libraries. So I'll pass it around. It's fun to see how small it is. And it's for sale on several continents already, so that's exciting. What I want to show you is the sense of community that has developed around that very briefly. So I rebooted my computer in the hopes that everything will now work. Because as we know, rebooting things fixes all problems. 
Um, so let's see if I can actually have an internet connection now. Maybe, maybe not. Google Guest, that's good. That's good, okay. So this is a track-based site on the CMU Cam, CMU Cam 3. You're welcome to go here, this is completely public. And um, you know, first of all what happens is we and our friends have developed software for it that we think is really fascinating. So just as an example, you know, there's simple Hello World programs, there's a security cam, this is kind of fun. You put the camera anywhere you want and turn it on. And whenever it sees people moving around, it takes a picture and saves it to the SD card. So you put it somewhere, a week later you pull out the card and you have kind of a picture of people moving in the area. Another fun one is a Viola Jones face detector, which is simple face detector on board the camera. And that's interesting because now the camera is spitting out meaningful information. It's telling you where all the faces are. And another fun one, if any of you remember Polly the robot? Um, so this is Ian Horsville's Polly implemented, and we have a, a better version implemented too that he helped us with a little bit. So again, Polly the robot on this camera, all of a sudden, bang, you can move around in an environment with a some kind of uniform textured floor and avoid the chairs and the, and the uh, banisters and avoid going down to your death down the stairs. What's really exciting about this though is the community. If I look at projects, I'm astounded by how many projects there are now. This is absurd. This is a research project pushed out just a few months ago and what we're seeing is a massive number of groups who have used the camera in interesting ways around the country and the world. That was great for, our, for us because we felt like you can push technologies out and with today's internet you can really make it available to people to be creative with. But um, the other thing I need to show you is a project that's for more than the sort of uh, knowledgeable computer hacker and that's Turk. When I was here last time I talked about Turk because we were trying to figure out a way for people in general to be able to be creative with robots for educational purposes. How can we let people really design and build their own robots and run with it? How can we make that problem really easy? And we decided that there were two major problems to solve, actually three major problems to solve. One was you needed a killer robot box. You needed a box that does all the power manipulation, that controls motors, controls servos, has USB 2.0 connectors for cameras, and does 802.11g, and has ethernet, and has serial ports, that has everything you could possibly want, 12-bit big analog, 12 -bit analog inputs, and digital outs, and digital ins. And of course, lots of LEDs for the kids. So we created such a thing called Quirk that's sold and designed by Charmed Labs. A good friend of ours named Rich Legrand runs that company. And uh, I'll pass that around. This is version two. This, this just came out. What's exciting about it is it has 10 LEDs and it's anodized. And I can't tell you how important being anodized is to kids. They love the fact that it's blue and it's anodized. So one part of it was that hardware. The other two parts were recipes. Can you create a set of recipes that anybody can build? Can you test them that way? And can they, just like kitchen recipes, be things that people can riff on and expand and then share back? So I'll show you some of those recipes just for fun. Now this is a web site, so let's go back to the web. Turk, R-I-C-M-U-E-D-U. You can just Google on Turk and you'll get right to it. You know, a year ago when I was here, we started with some simple recipes of these pan tilt robots. That one took two hours to build and cost about 500 bucks. We graduated to the flower robot that's been extremely popular. So a lot of people have been building this flower. And what's interesting about it is when they build the flower, which is basically a weekend project for a, a mother and daughter or father and son, once it's built, you can connect it to any RSS feed. So it's fun for people to connect it to, let's say, the stock market ticker so that it blooms and wilts, depending on what, whether they're capitalist or not. Um, or connect it to the weather tomorrow to take a look at the flower and see if it's going to be good weather or bad weather tomorrow. The other one that's turned out to be quite popular is this create, create recipe. Our lab is called Create, uh, Community Robotics Education and Technology Empowerment. So we had to do something with the Create robot for my robot, of course. So it's a vacuum cleaner without the vacuuming bits. Instead, it has a quirk on it, and it's internet connected. So you build this thing, turn it on, and bang, it's on the internet. So now you can program it using our iconic interfaces. You can program it in Java or Microsoft Visual C, or you can actually control it using direct teleoperation clients and such. And that's, again, turned out to be quite successful. In fact, this is being used right here at Ohlone College and Santa Clara College to teach Intro to C now, which is uh, your neighbors. But probably the most important thing that started happening over the last couple of months, which shows beginnings of success, has to do with projects from members. And I'm just going to dive into two of them for fun. 
One of them, very briefly, is Grok. It's in England. And he wanted to use our telepresence interface, but he really wanted a robot at human height because he's wandering around his kitchen and his living room with this robot. So he built a robot that's about that high. And it turns out the robot works pretty well. Let me see if I have a picture of it. It's a tripod on a little trackster style robot. The other one that I think is hilarious is Sporto. This is great. This is physical manifestation meets quality of life technology. He wanted to build an elastomeric robot that grows and shrinks based on how much exercise you get during the day. <laughs> it's a good idea, right? So you walk by this thing in your kitchen on the way to the chocolate chip cookie box, and it's just huge. Will that have impact on your behavior during the day if you place it in the right positions in your house? So beautiful idea. He's made this little mechanism that he's going to open source on the site so people can build them. And again, a really interesting idea of what happens when the community starts to build robots. So they're not roboticists anymore, right? They're people. And they have interesting projects that they want to share with the world. Now, for fun, I was going to run one piece of software. Because um, this idea of wonder and delight relates very closely to telepresence. That insect telepresence robot that we built was very successful. People love telepresence. They like to be in a different scale or a different space. And we have a lot of applications on here. There's a Robot Universal Remote. And yes, RUR also stands for Rustrum's Universal Robots. I know. That was on purpose. There's a dance studio that a lot of people have been using to create dances for their robots. There's a flower power iconic programming language that uh, we use in middle school girl programs. And there's uh, My First Robot program, which is a Java environment for programming your robot all you want. Everything open source, of course. But um, let me just run one of these teleop interfaces to show you just to give you a feel for what it's like to use these kinds of things. They're all Java web starts. So people just click on them and run them. They don't have to install anything, per se. But um, one thing we've added recently is, as you build a robot and turn it on, it immediately connects to the internet. But you can put it into either relay mode or direct connect mode. So you can build a robot, put it in your house, and either tempt fate and allow anybody in the world to connect to it, as long as they know your passwords. Or you can not tempt fate and keep it in direct connect mode so that they can't all connect to it. I'm going to go ahead and connect with the relay. And uh, I think I set this up so that there's a couple of robots at CMU that are actually running. Now, I got to tell you, my password's nice and long here. I have a story to share with you. My password used to be four alphanumeric digits long. And I'm going to tell you what happened. Because I gave this talk in England. okay, And I gave this talk there. And uh, I got home to my kitchen in Pittsburgh. And I had a stack of dishes on the kitchen table next to the robot that I had demoed in England. The stack of dishes was on the floor, broken. And the robot was on the floor, also broken. This was scary. So we went back and looked at all the logs. My password was four digits long, right? Somebody had managed to hack into the robot and drive it around my house four times while I was on the airplane back from England. <laughs> and on the fourth try, they managed to launch themselves and the dishes off the table. So that may be the first example of a certain kind of, uh, of interaction. Now, um, what do you think my password was? The project's called Turk, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was that bad. They, I think they made two guesses and they got it right on the second guess. They probably misspelled it the first time, right? <laughs> so there's a dog. Um, it's being very slow here right now. It's usually got a faster update than that. You can see me controlling the little joystick on the right. But uh, I don't know. My, my kids usually have a sense of humor in the lab, so we'll see if they put anything else that's funny in here, if it's just the dog wearing sunglasses. Oh, there's a purr. Check this out. Yeah, it's being too slow to respond. Or I'm being too, uh, too sudden in my motions. Let me try and get to the prayer for you. So usually, if I'm not having odd network problems, I'm getting about 10 frames a second out of the system. So it's not bad. And the latency is about a second. So you're a second behind the real world time. But I just wanted you to get an idea of these kinds of interfaces and the kind of telepresence that people tend to create with them. OK, back to the talk. Now, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with all this work. We've been concentrating on creativity using robots, on people creating robots, anybody able to create robots. And we're excited. We've got thousands of users of Turk. We've got three or 4,000 CMU cams being sold every quarter now. So these things are really out there, and people are using them. But there's no growth for this. This is not going to take over the world in a really exciting way. 
And there's a fundamental reason for that that's really important. And this is the shift that we've had, which I think is really important and worth telling you about. We, as a community of engineers, care about the engineering. We care about the currency of engineering itself, the technology. So long as our currency is about the technology, even if, if I'm creating creativity sites, but they're about the technology itself, they're about make your own robot that does anything you want a robot to do, we're not going to grow. We're not going to change the world. All we're going to do is make life better for a certain subset of people who care about that currency. So that has to change. And this is where our perspective has changed over the last few months. We think this is the wrong approach. Now again, you're too young for this, but some of you might remember in the 60s and 70s, late 60s, so that helps, uh, the topical music movement, right? So topical songs. Um, I think we need topical robotics. So really what we're missing is that our currency is utterly wrong. It's about technology. And instead, it has to be at everything that matters to people. So topos, the Greek word, comes from the idea of finding a place where there are arguments. It's a rhetorical device. It's about finding places where you can be compelling in your rhetoric, in convincing somebody of what you know to be true and care about deeply. So we need topical robotics. We need robots not to be about robots at all, but to be about what you care about. Now, that means it should all be about content and not about infrastructure. The robot is mere infrastructure, and what matters is what you're doing with it, not how you use the robot, but the message you intend to convey. Well, what is content and message? It's media. So what I'm really asking for is I'm asking for us to view robotics no longer as robotics, but as a tangible media. What we actually care about is media. We want people to create new media. It just happens to be that our media are going to have arms and legs. Sometimes they're going to flail wildly, and they're going to convey their message that way to us. So think about robotics no longer as robotics. Think about topical robotics as tangible media. And then what do you get? What does it mean to make a really powerful statement and happen to use embodied technology to make that statement. It means you're making a statement. It means the technology is not that important anymore. And if it's a, something that allows you to make that statement, that's really exciting. I'm going to give you an example from one of my favorite pieces of work. Natalie Jeremijenko is an artist and a professor. And she did some fantastic work. This one was called the Feral Dog Project. It's a how-to site. This is a piece of art in as much as it's also useful, OK? So don't view this as something you can do today. But it took poochies and other robotic toy dogs and converted them with a volatile organic compound sensor into something that could sense where industry has made dumps, toxic dumps, in the backyard of people's homes. So it's a feral dog out in a neighborhood looking for capturing and going toward toxicity. It likes toxicity. And then she had urban kids in New York City use these robot dogs to find all the toxic dumps in urban areas in New York City. And she invited the press, and they loved it. It was a bonanza. They loved it because it's a juxtaposition of kids with technology making a message, making a statement about where we have toxicity, what's wrong with our world. That is new media. It's not robotics anymore. It's new media. And that I find very exciting. We've been going down that path, too. Neighborhood Nets is a program that Intel funded. Incredible to me that a corporation so technically apt is also this interested in community. But the question was, can we take new technology and allow people in a neighborhood to paint messages that they wouldn't have been able to paint before using this new media? So we did a technology project where we had groups of people in a neighborhood called Lawrenceville in Pittsburgh wander the neighborhood. We gave them. Polaroid cameras, and we gave them new kinds of toxicity sensors, air pollution sensors, humidity sensors, and they mapped their neighborhood. They would go and see what the, the, the sewer reads and take a picture of the readings at the sewer together with a Polaroid camera. They would take a picture in an exhaust of a car, and in so doing, end up having a collaboration and a conversation with the driver of that car that was really fascinating to watch and, and, and model. Then they'd go back and make a collaborative map on the wall a collaborative map that shows their neighborhood, the sensor values that they got. What was going on that was really fascinating is that the robotic technologies were simply a window into the unobservable. They were allowing them to capture pollution values, carbon monoxide values, sulfur dioxide values, and capture the neighborhood in a way that they weren't used to capturing. Then we asked them for the city planners to make exhibits. What if you could design an exhibit that actually improved your city? What would you make? So this is great. 
This woman was really concerned about sound pollution on her road. So she connected one of our sensor systems to a servo, and it pushes down and takes a picture with a Polaroid camera. And she actually put this on her, on her front stoop and was taking pictures of the noisiest cars going by. Two Boy Scouts worried about the fact that on the residential area, the cars drive too fast. They made a sign, because the city's been refusing to put speed bumps on that road, that comes down and says, slow down whenever you go too fast. And it worked. You could move the car, and down comes the sign. Three 12-year-olds make a model of the bakery deli on their neighborhood block, connected to an RSS feed that counts the number of occurrences of violence in post-Gazette stories about the neighborhood. And pointers move up and down and jangle a bunch of nuts and bolts whenever there's occurrences of the word violence in press releases. This is 9- and 10-year-olds sketching an idea about the sensors they want to use, creating a physical rendering of their AnyBot sketch, and then building a robot that actually moves based on humidity, temperature, and air pressure in the room. It actually works. 9- and 10-year-olds built this. And then you interview them and ask them what they learned. And they say, uh, yeah, we didn't know it could really help people and animals, it, technology. We just figured it was just something that uh, could help people around their house. Roomba, of course. We didn't know it could do a bunch of other things in the world. You know, and this is beautiful, it was nothing, nothing here. And then we created something of our own. They've got a sense of authorship and empowerment over technology that they didn't have before in telling a statement, in making a message. And that, to us, was a very exciting direction to be going. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple more really fast, just for fun, um, because these are so much fun to share with you. These are from this educational program. We just had these gallery shows this week and last week. So this is very fresh. This is, a, um, this is an exquisite corpse. They took pictures of people in the uh, Mexican War Streets neighborhood of Pittsburgh, interviewed the people, cut them up into head, torso, and foot, and made a device that you stand by. And as you stamp on the floor, the feet move. As you shout into it, the heads move. And as you flail the middle of your body, the body moves. So it reconfigures the people into different uh, kind of combinations. He made a mood bench model. And he's actually going to build a full-size mood bench. It's a public park bench that becomes a gathering place for the public, where umbrellas open and close depending on the humidity and the weather tomorrow. This is kind of scary. If you take a cucumber and you not, not cut all the skin off and do just the right thing, you can make tendons out of the skin. And so this is a cucumber hand with a piece of gouda on top that moves depending on how much sound you put into the device. You thought that was crazy. Nano Krispies, a warning about the futures of technology. He produced carefully all sizes of this box, a Nano Krispies cereal box, and made a model Rice Krispies man using the uh, invisible, the visible man as a mold, made a Rice Krispies man, stuck it in milk with Rice Krispies, stuck our servos in the bottom, and it moves when you approach it. Yes, it moves when you approach it. And the story on here is all about the idea that nanobots are going to take over the world. It's beautiful. It's a piece of art. It's real art that you could put in a modern gallery. And this guy made this, and all these robots were made, in two-hour segments over the course of four weeks. That's eight hours total for kinetic art pieces that, to them, tell messages that they care about. So we had them use the Turk. But I want to tell you about one other technology that we had them use, because it's kind of an exciting new one. So this is brand new since last time I talked here. It's called the Canary. We just took standard sensors on the market that are really cheap and effective. A light sensor, a humidity sensor, barometric pressure sensor, sound sensor. Uh, my favorite one is a volatile organic compound sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide sensor. And made a little box out of it. Produced 50 of the boards. Now it has servo plugs on it, and you'll, you'll see why, because that's kind of where this gets fun. But first we have to ask the question, what's the right form for such a device that we want the public to use and feel comfortable with? Well, we surveyed that. We looked at a lot of different things off the shelf, because we wanted people to be able to build these themselves. And we tried all sorts of stuff. This is a crystal light container with all their goodies in it. This is a pencil case from IKEA. We settled on something that people can build at home with pieces of plastic from an art store. So we provide that mold to people. We provide that model as a... PDF document to people. They print it out, they slap it on the plastic, cut it out, and voila, they have a canary. Now, I don't know if you have a good guess as to why it's called a canary. You probably do. Um, 
I'll turn on and pass it around and put it in a mode where it just goes through all the various chemical indices and, and other values for this room. So just pass it around and check out the, what's on the screen. What was exciting about this device is it was all about exploration and wonder. Kids and adults wanted desperately to take this home and check their floor out. Is my room better with the windows open or closed on an ozone action day? Is my school OK? They just installed new carpeting. And I read that VOCs cause asthma. I wonder if there's a lot of VOCs in my school now. And are we all going to get asthma? This is stuff people actually care about. It's media. It's content. They collect it with the device. But there's more. You're going to see as this passes around, little wires connected to it. The reason for that is we gave them craft parts. They built whatever they wanted, joints, servos, whatnot. As soon as you build something, if you plug it into that device, then depending on which mode you put the screen in, it'll move. So without any programming, you can immediately make a kinetic art piece. You can make something that drops balls whenever there's a lot of noise, or something that draws in sand whenever there's a lot of pollution. And you can put two joints on it, right? So it draws in sand this way when there's a lot of pollution during the day, and this way when there's a lot of pollution at night. And so now you get a piece of art over time that tells you about the day-night difference between pollution levels. So that turned out to be an extremely effective tool. For humidity, by the way, if you blow into the fins, you'll actually see it pop up. Just use the right and left buttons to play with it if you like. So to us, that canary was an aha. And it was an aha because if you go back to my talk 10 months ago, we care about wonder because that really motivates people to learn. But the way we do that with things like Turk is by getting there via the path of ingenuity, which is well known that way. Engineering, the root engineer. It's ingenuity. It's all about the idea of being creative and building something that hasn't existed. But there's another path to wonder, right? Discovery, the natural sciences. Seeing and representing and appreciating what's in the world and how cool that is. So that path has turned out to be very important. And the canary combines them because you explore the real world and you build for it. Now, last time I talked, when I got to the Global Connection Project, I started with this slide, which is completely valid to start with again, because it is wonder. Right? This is the most popular picture from Apollo, ironic, because that was the moon mission. And as you know, there's this little thing we used to play with called Keyhole that's now here called Google Earth, which is a fantastic element of wonder. It's a way of exploring the universe and revealing detail. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is that our Global Connection Project added National Geographic stories to that Google Earth so that you can really read about places. So now you're exploring, but there's depth to the information, right? You go there, and you explore, and you uncover more depth. Of course, this has become a very popular concept on Google Earth now. Interesting that in, in its prime when we were first doing it, it was novel, the idea that you're really adding cultural content and depth to that image of the Earth. Now, let me talk about where we're going next. And I'll start with this picture to make that clearer. This was a picture where community started to play a major role. Because it was no longer about simple professional content that you provide for people to learn, that technology to human unidirectional arrow. Here we were talking about flipping that arrow around a little bit. Because in fact, disasters were occurring. The Kashmir earthquake in this case, the uh, New Orleans uh, hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. And in both cases, what happened is you could see communities of rescuers and people who care sharing information using Google Earth with overlays like these that we provided. And that was really exciting, because the community was deciding how to use the technology to support rescue services. The problem that we felt needed to be overcome that was exciting to us was the question of community control. What if people could really control everything about the perspective that they have on this explorable, shareable image? So I'll put the question out there first, right? If we think about topic, about the ability of people to be able to argue whatever they believe in and do that with technology, then what we really want isn't one Google Earth. We want, and this is metaphorical, I don't mean to have multiple Google Earths per se, but perspective. What we really want is for people to be able to create their own perspective de novo of what they care about visually and share that. So the resolution you have in a Google Earth is fantastic because you can, you can reveal detail. I want that for anything that you care about, whether it's a wetland in San Francisco or whether it's um, indigenous population in northern Alaska. Not starting with the globe, but starting at the human perspective of that world. Why is this interesting? This is interesting because if you can do this, people will be authors. People will be able to annotate theirs and other people's new worlds. And they'll be able to have discovery inside of that. It's also interesting because if you do this right, then people develop a power of rhetoric and more importantly, of cross-cultural interaction and empowerment that I think can go very far. So this is a way of maybe going disruptive. 
And so there's two things we have to do to pull this off, and I'll talk about those in the remaining time. If we want people to be able to create their own perspective with if infinite resolution, with enough resolution to be able to reveal detail and tell a story about a place or a thing as much as they want, right? New media. If we want people to be able to do that, they need to have two tools. One tool is what we call gigapans or gigapixel panoramas have to be available for everyone. Everybody has to be able to be an author. Now let's redefine everyone a little bit. Let's say everybody who can buy a digital camera, even a cheap digital camera, should be able to be an author of these. So we have to have an acquisition device that's so cheap that people can really buy it. It can't be a $12,000 device because it's all about scale, what we're talking about here. The second thing is we have to have a way using the internet for people to collaborate about these worlds. So they have to have a way to share and have a collaboration, a back and forth about the annotations and about the story behind why they care about that place. So you have to have a website and you have to have an acquisition system. Those are the two things we've been working on, and this is the first talk where I'm actually kind of uh, talking about the two things. So this is a, a new talk that way. This is the Gigapan camera robot, developed by a number of people. Um, I need to embarrass Randy Sargent, who's the co-PI on all this work. So uh, he plays a principal role in all of this, together with a large team, actually, including people here, at NASA Ames, CMUS, CMU, et cetera. And I think the right thing to do at this point is to show you a little bit of a demo and talk to you about the camera. So let me bring this over. So here is the robot device. Simple pan tilt mechanism. But now it gets kind of interesting. If we want people to be able to use their camera, you can't custom make this for a $10,000 camera that has a USB connection that's specially designed to take pictures, right? So this is where the robotics comes in. You need to make a device that any camera can be dropped into. So how do you make the picture get taken? This is an interesting question. USB doesn't work on cheap cameras these days. So that's where robotics comes in. There's a robotic finger on this that presses on the shutter. So what you do is you have a device here that, as soon as I figure out how to turn it on, there we go. We'll turn it on. You zoom it in all the way, so it's fully zoomed, right? And then you turn on the bottom half of the system, which is the gigapan camera part. And what this allows you to do now is it allows you to adjust the finger so that you're pushing down on the shutter. No big deal there, but very important, and it has to work extremely reliably. Set up your camera. So. Sorry while I set up the camera here. There we go. OK. So then what you do is you have this ability to take a picture. Let's say I want to take a panorama from uh, up there to over there. So I set the parameters of that camera panorama. And then off it goes to take a panorama. So what's exciting is that the robotic technology here is making it possible to do something that people don't have as much patience to be able to pull off themselves. Cameras today have fantastic optical zooms, as you can imagine, and very good megapixel ratings in terms of resolution. If you could zoom it in all the way like that, you're getting a little spotlight of image, right? You're getting a tiny bit of a picture uh, of, of the world in each of those pictures. Now, you could stand here with your camera and try and do this very carefully by hand. But can you take 500 pictures that way and get the right amount of overlap between the pictures? No, it's not possible. So that's what this buys you. But there's something else that buys you. We know the kinematics of the device. We know that you have the same equal angle between the camera pictures and the order in which the pictures were taken. So we can provide free software so that once you have the device, you can actually stitch it all together and make an extreme resolution panorama, one gigapixel or more. So that's the first part of the problem, is having such a thing. Now. Um, the exciting thing that I have to share with you today, we've got the production prototypes for this. We've got hard tooling in China. We're starting mass production efforts. And we'll be announcing sales and the ability for people to buy these in September. But you have one here that you can borrow. So I just trained up Alan Eustace. So Randy and I were visiting with him. We gave him one. And he's willing for anybody to borrow it. So if you want to borrow it and take lots of panoramas with it and upload them to the site, please feel free to contact Alan and you can get your hands on this. So that's a kind of a fun unit to use and, and play with. 
Now, I mentioned that there were two pillars. Let me go back to slides for a second. Nah, don't need slides. I said that there were two pillars, right? One is people have to be able to be authors in a very fundamental sense. Anybody has to be able to take these pictures. The other thing is people have to be able to share them with each other. As you can imagine, there's just too much resolution at hand here. Too many big pixels and too much memory for your average laptop to deal with. You can't have 50 of these on your computer. It's not going to fit. And so what you need is a website. But the website gets really interesting because you start to wonder to yourself, what does it take? What's the interaction design and what's the kind of workflow that will occur when people try and share these images with each other and share detail inside of them? Some people are going to take these panoramas and put them on a website. And they're going to want to talk about specific things in them. So you have to make that facility possible. Other people are going to look at it and see something else that the first person didn't even notice. There's a butterfly sipping nectar in that corner. Here's somebody who is wearing really interesting headgear. What does, that, what does that notate? What kind of tribe are they from? So you're going to have authors, both in the sense of authoring panoramas and in the sense of authoring content, discussion, discourse about the panoramas, whether it's the person who took it or not. So the site is Gigapan. And I think three days ago it was released, so you're welcome to try it out. Gigapan.org will take you there. And we already have a number of pictures there because we have some cameras and people have started using it. So it's in a fun way kind of this very early stages thing. My internet's being slow again. Hopefully not slow enough for you to get just an idea of what we're talking about. There's the San Francisco Golden Gate area. And this is the site. And it's all about searching and being able to find the discourses that have been occurring on the site. It's about browsing. And it's about contributing, you uploading pictures, which you may have taken with this GigaPan or not. There's some great professional artists who can take panoramas anyway. And they're welcome to upload it as well. So let me show you a few pictures just for fun. I'm going to go to, uh, here's, a, here's a popular one, Guatemala market. Just to show you the kind of things that happen when you have images of this nature. So I'll let that load up. And for those of you concerned about time, I'm only going to take four or five more minutes. So it won't be too bad. I won't be running you too late during your day. So there's the biggest flea market in, in actually, I believe, Central and South America. And this was taken by one of the people on our team named Leila Hassan. And uh, let me go to the most popular snapshots taken in here. You know, these are snapshots. These are pictures. You can see the little white squares occurring, pictures about which people have been snapping and making comments about them. There's some fun ones in here. Um, actually, before I do that, let me try and prove that it's Guatemala. You see the pickup truck there on the edge? It has a license plate and a dog and half a human, look. So let me keep going toward the license plate. And you can probably read it by now, Guatemala 2004. Here's another picture that I think is really exciting. Um, one of the things that happens when you create a picture like this is it generates massive numbers of questions. No matter what the author intended, people start to notice in the picture things that they have questions about. We noticed in this picture two things that we thought were really interesting. One is half the women are wearing something on their head, balancing something on their head like that. And in fact, we talked to somebody from Guatemala, and they said, oh yeah, all of the women that are aboriginal in, in ancestry can balance on their heads, no problem. And all the women who are of Spanish origin can't. And you can tell them apart that way. And then we noticed the thing on the right there. Look at the rope that guy has on his forehead. So we asked, what's that for? And he said, oh, well, that's how you carry things. Said, what do you mean? He said, that's how you carry really heavy things. You put the rope on your forehead, and you tie it behind you. That's how you carry heavy things. You don't use your hands, because you want your hands free. So we said, well, what kind of things would you carry here like that? And so he said, oh, just look up in the picture. If you look up to the right, there's exactly the kinds of things you'd carry that way, televisions. So it's a fantastic example. Here's another accidental discovery. We'll zoom out and go in on this guy's uh, badge. But it's always interesting to find uh, you know, members of your own government somewhere. So this guy's belt says FBI on it. <laughs> Again, completely, utterly accidental discovery, right? But a couple of other kinds of, uh, of wonder that often happen. I'm going to show you the waffle. And then I'll move right on. Obviously, since this is a public site now, you're totally welcome to explore it and to uh, contribute to it yourself. So I don't really need to show you very much of it. But this is a kind of a fun thing to show you, is the juxtaposition between the satellite and the, and the local perspective. This is from Burning Man. How many people have actually seen this live? Anybody here? Anybody went to Burning Man last year? 
Man. OK, good. Scaring me there. I'm thinking, nobody from Google went to Burning Man. This is terrible. So this is a, this is a two by four by eights. These are two by fours, folks. This is a massive structure. And it's got you know, great signage, too. Let me see. French fries, mystery object. Here's an interesting one. So look at the resolution on that sign. Don't look yet. And what I wanted to show you that's kind of exciting about the site, it's having trouble loading that. What it says is no climbing on structure. We'll, we'll wait and see if it gets the resolution going. Here's a, a, a Google view from above. So first of all, if you didn't know this about, well, this makes me feel better. I'm having just as slow a time here. If you didn't know this about Burning Man, this is kind of cool. Look at how regular the pattern is, how well laid out it is. And if you pull back, you can actually see earlier versions of Burning Man in the sand. But here's the structure. Look at that. There's the arm. And if you go to the device, there's the resolution that we wanted. But in fact, the arm is there. If I pull it out and joystick to the left, there's the arm. So it's really exciting because you start to see this juxtaposition between an overhead view and an internal view. I'm going to let you explore that site yourself. And let me provide you with some closing remarks, given time. Not that fast. First of all, there's something special about not being a company, about being a university and being able to be master of who uses the technology. When you have a company that's trying to make a cool camera like that, who are your early adopters? They're technology geeks. They're people who have really cool cameras and they tricked out systems, and they're going to go and do great things with it. Our early adopters are a completely and utterly different set of people that I find really exciting. Our early adopters, and this is not a theoretical list. This is who's actually using this right now. It's families exploring local neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. It's 20 elderly African Americans in a blown out neighborhood called Braddock who are trying to capture what's wrong and what's right about their neighborhood right now. It's high school friend groups that are documenting history and heritage using the architecture of Pittsburgh right now. It's Warhol and Mattress Factory resident artists who rarely have access to this kind of technology. And then it's UNESCO. We have a program in UNESCO where we're going to be starting with schools in the Affiliated Schools Program in South Africa and Central America, having kids share pictures of how food is made, harvested, grown, and eaten in their part of the world, and then sharing cultural information back and forth. We have Alaskan Inupiaqs who have a language that's disappearing, and they want to do language elicitation using gigapans. So they take gigapans of the elder's home, and then the elder talks about everything in their home. And so they elicit all the words in their language that are hard to capture when you show them pictures of New York City. And that's what they do today. So that's the kind of early adopters we talk about. This is another exciting aspect of it. When your educational mission scales well, together with Turk and Canary and Gigapan, this is just the places where there's workshops going on by teachers we've trained this fall and this summer. So that number of places, each one 20 to 40 kids, are actually having experiences with the technologies today. And that means we're going to be able to learn that much more about how to scale it up to other cities. But basically, the city of Pittsburgh is going to be, in a sense, transformed by a discourse about robotics and about topic. And that's something that we find exciting. So let me finish now, last two slides. Um, I started my talk 10 months ago by talking about learning and by defining it in terms of wonder, the edge between what people know and don't know. It's a beautiful definition from Aristotle, because it's the idea that learning only occurs at that boundary. You can't learn recursion by programming the Fibonacci sequence when you're clueless about math. By the way, we do that to our kids in high school. You learn by taking what you do know, what you don't know, and crossing that edge by giving them something they care about. But if it's really something they care about, and if this idea of new media and tangible media makes sense, then I'm going to claim there's kind of a resolution we can make of the definition, which is really learning is, I think, the edge between what people are passionate about and what they don't know. So if we can make technologies available to them so they can have discovery right around the periphery of what they actually are passionate about, that's how I think we can have real social impact in the world. That's what technologists, I think, should do. So last slide. Um, I want to welcome you to our community. I would like you to log in to gigapan.org, try it out, and let us know what you think. I would like you to find a mission, find something you care about, and gigapan it, upload it. I'd like you to build a robot and share it with the Turk website. And probably most importantly, and for the most extra credit, I would like you to think about how you can create a technology empowerment program in part of your community. We're doing this in three communities, 40 venues right now. If you have a place, a community center, if you have a boys and girls club, a youth places, a YMCA, 
anywhere that you have access and you believe they could benefit from a technology empowerment program, we have curriculum we can just give you, and we can fund robots for you and give them to you for free. So we can give you all the parts you need to create this kind of topical robot program anywhere you want to create it. And that's something I'd be, love to see uh, us collaborate with anybody on. Last thing I should do is acknowledge everybody. Uh, I have two people who co-PI everything, and I'm a co-PI along with them. There's a lot of labs that are connected with this, uh, both in Pittsburgh and here in the West Coast. And there's a lot of people who were lucky enough to get funding from, not least of all, of course, Google Corporation. And it's interesting to note that all these folks give us unrestricted gift funding. So they're not looking for technology back out from us. They're just looking for us to change discourse about technology and empowerment. So thanks for your attention. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, you said that you want to keep the uh, big and uh, pretty not in expense, but uh, accessible to people. This is going to, when it comes out in September, it'll cost $280. So that's cool because the camera is about that price point. So basically, for the price of your camera, you'll buy a GigaPan, assuming you have a small format camera. I'm hoping that when they build them in the millions, it'll be coming down in price, but we can't bench on that. Your hand was up first. Say again? Yes, the, 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 the question was, what's available on site and how is it available? The um, Quirk processor is available. If you just Google Quirk, you'll go to our site, and we'll take you to Charmed Labs where you can buy it. The CMU cam is available on a number of companies, and again, our site points you to them. The GigaPan camera is not available yet. You have one at Google right now that you can borrow. However, it'll be will it be announcing availability in September, at the end of September. And at that point, you can put post orders. The place you'll be posting orders will probably be Charmed Labs. And if you go there, then there'll be a form where you can post your order and, and get one. Last question. Yes. Is the, uh, slow, sorry. Is the slow speed of the time it takes to take a gigapixel image um, a problem for your algorithm? That's a good question. Uh, the short answer is no. It's not a problem for the algorithm. But it's caused some really fun artwork to results. So, it's taking the picture and going to the next position. And you can tell it with the buttons how much delay you want between pictures. So you can speed it up or slow down a little bit. And um, when I take a good gigapan, it'll take me 15 or 20 minutes to take one, one that has lots of resolution, you know, large, large uh, breadth of area. What happens that's kind of fun is, for instance, last week I was on a ship in, the, in Seattle in a lock. And as the lock lowered me 30 feet, I took the gigapan and started it. And the ship came out of the lock. And as it came around, the sun set. And I continued the GigaPan as we went around Seattle. So the picture is really neat. It's not a picture of the real world. It's a fourth dimensional picture. It's a picture of the real world over time as you look left to right. So there's interesting effects you can get like that. There's a dance company that we're talking to, the uh, Ballet Theater, actually. It's the Ballet Dance Company in Pittsburgh. And they're interested in doing some artwork with the robots. So I'm interested to see what happens when people, on purpose, take advantage of the fact that it takes time to take the picture. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Hila. And uh, yeah, please, everyone, uh, join me in, in thanking Hila for the exciting talk. Thanks. Thank you very much.